This is a place where the infinite is possible. And you've just happened to find yourself here. This is not a coincidence. You have been called here to help yourself. If you pay close attention, you can empower yourself to be your own healer, to be your own person, to be your own source of happiness. And that's where it all begins. This is the BC Podcast. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome and thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm so excited to bring you this podcast. Oh, I had so much fun speaking with Quatley. <laughs> it was so good to hear his voice again. And I miss him. I miss him a lot. And uh, yeah, he's he's a cheeky man, but he's full of wonderful important information and knowledge and wisdom and grace and grounding and morals and he just he 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 articulates it all really really well and i feel very honored to be able to connect with him and bring him onto this platform for you all to you know soak in soak up the knowledge that he's willing to share and this podcast is mostly about peyote and what it can do for you in your life and the benefits it has and the lessons it can teach you and we touched on you know connecting with nature and the universe and with ourselves as well but it's mostly about peyote so please enjoy and giggle along with me (laughs) let's get into it hello beautiful people welcome to the bc podcast my name is beck and today I have a very wonderful man by the name of Quatley. Hello, Quatley. Hello, Beck. <laughs> how, <laughs> how are you on this fine, sunny, by the looks of things, morning? It's a beautiful Mother's Day morning here. The sun is shining all morning, and I was out in the garden. Oh, lovely. Take care of the plants, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule for this. Always happy to share whatever we can uh, share with the, the listeners. Maybe they could find something in the conversation that can help them with uh, something that, they're, that they would like to know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I've met you a few times now in your travels and you are an expert, I'd say, on the peyote medicine. And would you... Uh, you know, the, the, I'd be classified as an expert in Australia because basically in order to be an expert, you have to be out from out of town. Right. Okay, so I'm an expert in Australia. I wanted to know about your beginnings with working with peyote and how you kind of found it. I was about 19 or 20 years old. And I decided to go to Mexico to visit the place where my grandfather was born, which is a city called Matehuala, San Luis Potosí, is the state, San Luis Potosí. And this is very close to Real de Catorce, which is kind of the center of Wilicuta. And Wilicuta could be interpreted as 
like the sacred lands of the peyote, uh, where the peyote grows. And during that travel, I I was uh, I met some friends and um, this guy named Carlos who had just come ceremony ceremony with the with the Huicholes, with the Huidarica people, showed up and wanted to know if we wanted to eat some of the peyote that they had given him instructions on how to share this peyote. And that was the first time I, I ate peyote was with these guys in uh, Mexico. Wow. And then your passion grew immediately from there? Like, when did you want to learn more? Yeah, it was, of course, anybody, anybody that's ever eaten peyote or, you know, done... Um, a ceremony with with uh, some plants, powerful plants, will attest to the fact that it's an unforgettable moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, basically, it was like this, and and yeah, the experience w- had a profound, a very deep, um, very deep um, effect. On, on my on my persona and I left Mexico just like longing to to uh, partake of of, of this uh, ceremonies again and I had to return to the states and I started searching in the United States for people of the same culture and I found out that there was a large group of native people that partake of this, uh, the, you know, sacrament, you could call it, in religious ceremonies and um, under the umbrella of the Native American church. And these ceremonies are celebrated in uh, teepees, usually, or in the outdoors, <clears throat> or in different traditional lodgings, longhouses, um, hoguns, pit houses, you know, things like this, and uh, along with teepees, and sometimes in their living rooms, too. And so I got connected with this vast network of indigenous people that are uh, celebrating these peyote ceremonies pretty much on a regular basis. Mm, Beautiful. Yeah. (laughs) And then... um... Did you have to take a trainee ship or anything like that, or you just you just kept hanging around them? <laughs> well, um, yeah, there's there's several ways to to associate yourself. If you become a member, usually people that come to the ceremonies are expected. If there's you know this is not there's no it's it. It's hard to call it a formal religion. It's it's more like a practice, and what you learn is is to help out. You know, it's a cooperative uh, society. So there are some preparations for each ceremony: chopping wood, putting up the teepee, clearing the land sometimes. And uh, so yeah, you, you're you're expected after a while <clears throat> to to learn how to help in the preparation. And then as, as people become more confident with your participation, you begin to uh, take roles in the actual ceremonies. Keep tending the fire, singing, uh, hitting the drum, tying the drum and carrying the drum all night, uh, assisting the newcomers, uh, praying with the cedar, praying with the tobacco. All these are, uh, I guess, more advanced forms of participating in these ceremonies and I was pretty diligent in participating I would sometimes go like twice a weekend you know every weekend I actually moved to Arizona because in Arizona there's 21 native reservations Mm. probably more like uh, Oklahoma Oklahoma and Arizona are the states that have some of the largest numbers of what you call reservations which are basically places where the U.S. government herded the native people in, you know, to to keep them captives. And they developed into, like, little communities. And in Arizona, there's 21 of these communities, and so I would travel around to these different communities on the weekends and participate in the uh, 
and the peyote ceremonies and the sweat lodges and the dancing and the prayers and the other uh, ceremonies, coming of age, sun dance, all of these different um, traditions that are still kept alive in, in these uh, reservation communities. So you've touched on a bit of those traditions and I wanted to ask about the initiations into manhood and womanhood within your culture. Yeah, some of them are very elaborate, very defined. Um, young women, when they, when they come of age, there's uh, an elaborate ceremony where the women are... Um, they organize themselves into like stations and the young girls go from one, well, they're young women now, I say the, the girls, the young women, they're in this transition period. They go from one station to the other and they're, they're kind of set up to the different directions. And in each direction, some of the elder women offer them guidance and advice on how to understand this, these transformations that they're going to into womanhood. And meanwhile, people are dancing all around with uh, music and drums, and yeah. And, and then afterwards, there's a big feast, and this is this is one form of initiation. Each each uh, people, each society, each nation has uh, many times very distinctive rites of passage for both men and women. Young men are usually expected to to go into sweat lodges uh, for some days and then um, in many cultures they go out into the forest or into a mountain and fast for four days alone. Wow. Some people call this vision quest. It's, uh, it's pretty common practice uh, among most native people where the young men have to go into the different ways. Some of them that it's set up where they have a support system and other cultures they just venture out by themselves like i said each each people has a, a distinct way of of conducting these ceremonies but usually it entails that a young a young man would would uh, endure thirst and hunger so as to strengthen his spirit <clears throat> and get more connected to the elements praying with uh, tobacco and cedar and and this way ask for guidance from the spirit as to what his uh, mission in life could be. Mm. And would any of these initiations um, include peyote? Yes, they, they could. Yeah. It depends on the particular community. Mm -hmm. Like in all of these ceremonies, Peyote could or could not be used because, um, yeah, peyote is not uh, accepted in some of the Christian, uh, I guess you call them Christian natives, you know, a lot of, and then in some of the Christian natives, they do accept it. Yeah. it, it it's, you'd have to make like a large scheme of, communities and then check off what they do and do not do right. you know, it's like this yeah. it's, like, it's, it's very diverse mm. and the one that I participated yes they do they do encourage the youth to to ingest peyote and pray with it use it to help guide them mm. and um what has peyote taught you personally like can you summarize some of the big lessons well, um, like big moments in your life. It's very fast. I, I mean, the, the understanding, it's like, um, it, the understanding that you, that you can acquire by, um, becoming familiar with, with the plants is, uh, it ranges from scientific to mystic to, yeah, almost incomprehensible. Because, I mean, when you think about the basic things that people, the questions they ask, you know, like who created the universe, you know, what's our purpose in life, uh, you know, what, what can we do with this modern society, how can we correct all of these things? 
um, how to become a better person, you know, how to understand natural phenomena, how to relate to each other, all of these things, you know, how to learn how to sing. I mean, there's, it's just so, uh, it's a vast array of information that basically peyote, if you have um, some questions about how to proceed in life, no matter what point you find yourself, when you encounter this medicine, it will assist you in clarifying. It brings a lot of clarity. Mm. And it also gives you physical endurance and physical strength to carry out these, um, these instructions that you may receive through the, through the spirit, from the spirit realm. Because a lot of times these things are, they seem like um, they're, they're physical challenges. And the peyote will help you in the physical realm also to be able to accomplish these these goals that, that may uh, be assigned to you, I guess you could say. Yeah, I definitely felt like the ceremonies that I've sat in were my own initiations into different aspects of my life and myself. And um, yeah. very challenging physically the first time. And then the second was a breeze physically, <laughs> but more mental. Yeah. Mm. You know, like, for example, I can give you a very clear example. Okay. <clears throat> There's some people that come in the ceremonies, they're addicted to substances. Yeah. And it takes a strong willpower to be able to break these addictions. And I'm not only talking about substances, I'm talking about just addictions, you know, addictions to certain types of personalities, addictions to a lot of things that are on the internet, you know, video games, pornography. I mean, it doesn't have to just be, um, you know, chemical substances. But then, there, of course, there are a lot of chemical substances, starting with alcohol and the whole array of, of uh, things that are available for, for people to to use as, as crutches or as, um, yeah, addictions, you know. And peyote has been proven to help individuals gain the willpower and the strength to transform their addictive personalities into personalities that are healthy and self-sustaining personalities, you know. Yeah. Some people are addicted to drama, man. Some people are addicted <laughs> to emotional. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. There's all these things, and, and somehow peyote shows you. It's like a big mirror. Yeah. And I... it shows you. It's like a truth serum. Yeah. It's like looking into a. It's like looking into the the mirror. It's a mirror, mirror on the wall. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good ass kicking, right? Um, I definitely found. I found myself looking at myself, but it was like surprising to me. There's, there's like no hallucinations. Um, there might, might be like an occasional fluorescent green image that I might see, but it was like split second and then gone. And then back to just being reminded of things about myself and about what I'm doing. It communicates in a whole different way to other plant medicines. It heightens your sensory perception. In other words, your vision becomes keen, your auditory becomes very keen. You know, it, um, your emotions, your intuition, all of this is is honed, and and everything becomes very crisp, very very colorful. And lots of times people uh, see this as hallucin. You know, it could be like I'm hallucinating, but no. Sometimes it's just the sharpness that you receive for your senses. Mm. And then again, there are things, visions, you could call them, that people receive if you're lucky. Mm. 
Okay. You know, and if you eat a large quantity, and if this is your request, but people can't handle this, you know, they start freaking out. So I always tell people, look, if you start seeing something that looks like you're, you know, not in this normal reality, just don't freak out. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, have, also, have you worked with many other plant medicines? I think I've worked with most of them. Mm-hmm. There's a couple I know that I haven't, but as far as if you name a plant medicine, I probably worked with it at some point or another. Okay. All right. Cool. And uh, do you do you like? they add value in combination or is there like a, a way that you would use them when you're you know, so involved in peyote? Yes. Um, especially in this day and age, you know, like maybe some years ago, people were very reluctant and very cautious to mix traditions and plants. But in 2019, people have had an opportunity to uh, explore and become acquainted with with so many different plants and and the cultures. And it's uh, almost becoming common practice now to combine the medicines, either in the same ritual or in a series of rituals. Like uh, you could call it a medicine festival or a spiritual gathering where one night, you know, you could partake of ayahuasca, the next night, San Pedro, the night after that, Santo Daime, and then the night after that, you know, you might have peyote and then like this, you know, and, and then in some instances, you could, you know, partake of ayahuasca in the evening and then maybe come towards the morning and you could eat San Pedro or peyote. And then even during these events, you could also uh, partake of uh, tobacco, hape, or, you know, like pray with tobacco. Tobacco has, has its own power too. Some people underestimate it because of the common use of it in, in the form of cigarettes and leisure smoking but tobacco is a very sacred plant that can induce um, spiritual awareness when used properly mm. you know and um, yeah sometimes they combine um, Santa Maria you know marijuana in uh, a ritual sense this is a common practice in the Santo Daime the ayahuasca of Brazil, and also in the Amazon, and some some of the people there combined it, and yeah. So then the list goes on. You know, there's there's a lot of other plants, and even I guess you could say um, other medicines, the combo, mm. the toad, the beautiful toad, and. Um, when I was in Ibiza, I, I was stung by a jellyfish on my arm. And I had, it was just right after a peyote ceremony, and I realized how much clarity and strength it gave to me that I was seriously considering getting a bucket of these jellyfish <laughs> and start offering them as a. Wow. But no, I didn't do it. I didn't. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing. Animals can give us so much too, right? They can. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you say if if used properly with tobacco, how how does one use tobacco properly? Well, first of all, um, yeah, tobacco, chocolate, a lot of things that were ceremonial, um, ceremonial plants. You know, the cacao plant was used particularly for um, 
Well, you asked me about tobacco, but I'm using cacao yeah, as an example. Yeah, that's fine too. That's it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, it, it it goes along the same vein, you know. Yeah. It's, uh, okay, take coca leaf. You know, mm. uh, all of these plants were used with definite uh, purpose in mind, and this is to contemplate the universe to to bring human existence into harmony and balance with the rest of uh, life here on earth. So tobacco is basically used for, what, in a nutshell, you could call spirit communication. In other words, if you want to communicate your thoughts, your feelings, let's say you want to go hunt a buffalo or hunt a deer, or harvest the corn or something, you use the tobacco to communicate your intentions so that there's a clear message between the energetic um, existence, you know, like, um, it's as simple as saying, okay, you're going to go swim in this, um, in the ocean or something. Sometimes people just jump in the ocean and the sea, they don't really stop to take a moment to say you know wow you know this is a vast spirit here the ocean you know but most native people will take the time to take a pinch of tobacco or light a little smoke and just pray just offer some gratitude and some appreciation to the ocean or to the river or to the waterfall or to the spring before drinking this is a common practice and tobacco is used to create this line of communication much like cell phones are used today in the modern world <laughs> <laughs> it's like a spiritual internet <laughs> <laughs> ah lovely huh that's good hmm. even though nowadays people just use tobacco to make smoke you know <laughs> I was wondering why they, you know, like I told these guys, I asked these guys, why, why do you smoke? You know, well, cause I like to make smoke. Okay. <laughs> you know, <this> is... <laughs> I think that's where the vaping has taken off as well. Um, <laughs> the ones that aren't full of nicotine, the ones that just want to make smoke. <laughs> <laughs> you can make a lot of smoke with those. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is your your mission and, and why are you doing what you're doing? Well, uh, I have quite a few missions, but in regard to the peyote, I think at some point after making various pilgrimages to, to the land of uh, Wirikuta, once I realized that um, it's a proper thing to do to journey to this sacred place and leave offerings repeatedly year after year after about five years some of my elders they said well if you have like a something you'd like to request from the spirit of the peyote you could you could make a request and it occurred to me like this idea came to my mind that i would like to to travel around the planet and help people to understand how this plant is um, beneficial not only individually but to humanity mm. you know because peyote has a bad rap you know in some places among some people in certain circles in the government and they think peyote is a drug that could harm you that could make you go crazy or you know something like this when this has nothing to do with this it's basically a plant that can heal many of the ailments that have been caused by this society. A lot of violence, a lot of, uh, that's perpetuated, you know, a lot of um, abuse, a lot of lack of respect for, for things in general, you know, for people, for the earth, for plants, for animals. It, it, it's, got, it's gotten out of hand, you know, and peyote, uh, has a way of reorganizing your appreciation for life in general and then in particular for for other people for yeah for everything for the plants and the animals so peyote has 
um, proven just in my own personal experience to heal many of the physical, the psychological, the emotional, and the spiritual ills of humans or wherever they find themselves. I mean, I've traveled to 33 different countries. And in those different countries, I must have gone to a total of like hundreds of cities. Like in Australia, I went to Byron, Melbourne, Perth, uh, Sydney, and uh, yeah. And so like in each country, I go to various cities, you know, and in each of these cities, I'm always astounded by the number of people that send me feedback of the things that they were able to transform in their life, things that were bothering them, alcohol addiction, anxiety, uh, depression, alcohol, yeah, all, all of these things. That people write me back and they go, you know, they come to a ceremony a year later. I go to Australia like once a year and they come back to the ceremony and they offer these uh, testimonies and the ceremonies of what they were able to transform and the year period since I had seen them last. And this is usually the case. Like I said, I've been to 33 different countries. I've been to Africa, to Asia, Muslims, Jewish, Christian, Native mm -hmm. communities in Canada, all of Latin America. And no matter where you go, peyote is beneficial. So this, I guess you could say, is part of my mission and then I guess you could complement this by the mission of helping people to learn how to conduct the actual uh, prayer ceremonies themselves. Mm. Or at least to know how to use the peyote on an individual basis, whether it's microdosing or for like a ceremonial prayer, and to be able to 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 utilize the peyote to heighten this healing and and also to heighten their spiritual communication. Can you talk a bit more about microdosing for us? Yeah, microdosing. I, I you know maybe I should preface microdosing by maybe a little explanation. The limited information that I have about the molecules that compose the chemical makeup of peyote. Sure. And for example, eight of these molecules are antibiotic. The strongest being peyotin, as they've, they've labeled it. <laughs> and these are natural antibiotics that work in amazing ways. For example, you could actually put some on a cut that's infected, some dry peyote or squeeze the juice and it will help promote the healing, fight the infection. And then there's other uh, chemicals that some of these molecules that regulate the endocrine system of a human, starting with the pineal gland, the pituitary gland, going down the line, the thyroid, the thymus, all the way down, the adrenals, the, the gonads, and helps regulate the production of hormones, whether it's to curb the production of too much adrenaline, for example, or to increase the amount of serotonin or other uh, hormones that are lacking. And these adrenal, adre uh, the, uh, excuse me, the endocrine system, the gland system is directly connected to the chakras of a human. And the hormones are the physical element that help the energetic field, the chakras, to be in harmony and balance. Mm. So by microdosing, the peyote kind of works its way through your physical system, through your energetic system, and regulates the imbalances that have been caused by living in modern society. People are stressed out. People are, don't eat the right foods. People are thinking too much, 
sex, for example, and this, this, uh, especially in youth, mm. you know, they're bombarded with sexual and this, the pineal gland, the meditation needs to be enhanced. So peyote is great for meditation, for stimulating these higher level chakras, the crown chakra, the, the third eye, you know, this, and I understand everything in forms of energy. This is one thing that peyote showed me. So to understand the human experience, you need to understand the energetic makeup of a human. And then you could see how microdosing or taking peyote in small quantities, let's say for a number of days, I usually recommend 13 days, like a little half a teaspoon of peyote powder or a button or two, you know, in your smoothie in the morning. Mm-hmm. Best time to take it. Because it, it it gives you so much energy. If you take it in the evening, you probably won't sleep. Unless you have something to do all night, and it's great. But usually I recommend people take a little bit of peyote in the morning. And, you know, there's people probably listening to this podcast that have peyote growing in their, in their homes. Yeah, I, I imagine them too. I found out <laughs> that people actually, the peyote is spreading around the world. And yeah. people actually have peyote, they don't know how to use it. Mm. So you could actually cut the top of the peyote button because it's going to regenerate new buttons and and use that button, maybe eat a quarter of it each day for four days, for example, in the morning. And this is going to shift. It actually shifts certain things in, in your mentality and in your physical being. Four days is a small amount. But you, you could, if you have enough to keep eating, like I said, a minimum of 13 days, you will see something um, change in your understanding. There was a young woman who was uh, 24 years old in England. And the people in England will remember these. A lot of these things that I say, I don't really need to say the names because people who were there can attest to these things. But yeah. She had been smoking marijuana every day of her life since she was 11 years old, according to her. Wow. And her brother had recently overdosed on heroin. And she came to a ceremony to kind of, um, yeah, heal some of this grief that she was feeling. And after the ceremony, she says, you know, I, I, I think our family had, you know, some kind of addiction complex because I've been smoking marijuana. I tried to stop smoking marijuana and I just can't. And, and I told her, you and I both know that marijuana, there's, it's not a bad plan. But addiction could be detrimental to your own psyche, you know, to have to wake up and to have to smoke. You know, like you have no choice you just have to smoke you know this is not good mm. I told her okay look I'm gonna gift you some powder and take it for 13 days and just see how it goes so a year later in the ceremony she goes can I express myself she goes you know I took this peyote that you gave me and I took a nice quantity and I go okay I'm gonna try not to smoke so much today well it was the first day she hadn't smoked she went through the whole day without smoking. And she woke up the next day feeling good, so she took another spoon. And then she went two days without smoking. So to make a long story short, she said she went 13 days, which was the longest period in her life that she ever went without smoking. And she says now she can smoke, but she's not addicted. She actually, it actually changed her whole perspective on marijuana. Like, she can smoke, but she's not addicted. Wow. And this was her testimony in the ceremony. For example, this is one mm-hmm. case where microdosing was able to shift her, how could you say, um, her understanding of her own self. Because before, if you asked her, can you not smoke, she would say no. But then with the help of the peyote, the energy that the peyote gives you, this divine energy, if she was able to switch in her mind, her understanding of her own self. That's beautiful. Yeah. I'm, I'm already thinking of a few people I want to send 
this podcast tour ready for that you know weed addiction it's a it's a thing and like addiction in general but a lot of people think you can't get addicted to weed or to any of these substances but you can um how you mentioned spirit just before and and how how does spirit and spirits come through and and how can they you know, guide us to to where we need to be? Like, how do we listen? How do we how do we accept that that's information coming through for us? Well, <clears throat> you know, the human the mind arranges energy into the perception that we have and. In, in uh, the peyote experiences, um, you could receive messages from from other dimensions that exist. And when they communicate, they usually analyze your your uh, your mind to see what it is that's most receptive. To your own personal, uh, your own personal, um, how can you say it? Interpretation of reality. For example, if you're if you believe in the Bible and angels, for example, then an angel might appear to you, mm. you know, and it might have a message for you, as happens in many times like in biblical experiences angels appear to people appear to the virgin mary they appear to moses something like this you know so if you're in tune to this you know the angels of the four directions and the angel our, our, uh, what's his name michael the archangel and this some people see angels okay other people are more in tune to a natural experience maybe they didn't have this religious upbringing so they see things in terms of hummingbirds and flowers and butterflies. And so then they might have an experience where, you know, a plant or an animal will contain a message for them. And then some people are more visual. Some people are more audio. Some people are more feeling, you know, more intuitive. So peyote is going to open up your... Uh, capacity to receive messages and structure from other realms. Uh, some humans think that this is this is the only reality that exists, and you know I'm not trying to convince people one way or the other, you know. But um, it is possible. There's a possibility that there are other forms of life in the universe <laughs> <laughs> intelligent yeah. forms of life yeah. forms of life that want to communicate and assist humans on this planet yeah. maybe they're from this planet maybe they're another form of existence you know they could be insects you know they could be like maybe the bees realize that humans are are killing them, killing the bees, which are very necessary for our own survival. Yeah. And maybe the bees are intelligent, you know, maybe they are intelligent. How do they make these honeycombs? How do they go around and gather all this pollen and make all this, you know, fertilize all, uh, pollinate all the plants that we eat, you know? Maybe it's just so, just might be possible that their intelligence could try to communicate something to somebody, you know, like stop polluting, you know, <laughs> stop destroying, you know, mm -hmm. appreciate the flowers, appreciate the other insects, you know, maybe the planet itself, the spirit of the planet could actually speak to someone. I had an experience where I, I, I felt or I thought I heard the Mother Earth talking to me. Yeah, I've had a similar thing too. 
Huh? I've had a similar experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and and what she was telling me was, you know, when you're traveling around the world, people ask you where are you from, right? And uh, and you usually give them an answer, right? And I go, yeah. And well, from now on, tell them you're from the planet Earth. <laughs> 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 I go, they're going to think I'm a wisecracker, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, you tell them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, um, how can, like, our connection to nature is is absolutely vital, but how can we develop a stronger one? Like, many of us live in concrete jungles. Many of us... F- have forgotten and and how like i know for myself i live i have moved out of a block of units apartments to to i had to be around trees so i've got a i rent a place that has all trees around me but it's still not enough i know <laughs> i went over east and i was out in you know the lush tropical queensland and and I felt so recharged, but then coming back here, I'm like, it's just not enough. I need more. I'm, I'm losing my <laughs> mind now. But how how can we develop a stronger connection to nature? I think it's a daily practice. Mm-hmm. I mean, myself, I drink a glass of water first thing in the morning, and everybody that knows me knows that this is what I preach. You know, if I preach anything, it's drink a glass of water in the morning. That's my religious advice for everyone. (laughs) When you drink this water every morning, you do it consciously. You know, I mean, everybody knows we're made up of a large percentage of our physical being is water. But what they don't put in the dictionary is like water definition. You know, if the first definition of water would be the spirit of life, or something like this, you know. No, they put H2O, you know, a liquid made up of chemicals, you know, they, they, they depersonalize water. And once you start drinking water every day and looking in that glass of water and realizing that this water is alive, it has life, that's the reason we're alive. If it wasn't for water, we would not be alive. Mm. The, the water itself is, is alive, you know, and it's, it's not dead. It's not just a liquid, you know, it's a living being, the water on this planet. And of course, the planet is a living being, you know, even though I've had these discussions with some religious folks from other religions and they go, no. I said, when I grab a handful of dirt, I go, this is alive. No, that's dirt. I go, you think it's dead? Yeah, it's dead. I go, no, when I grab a handful of dirt, I feel the life in that handful of dirt. It's a piece of my mother. Mm. So it's this simple, you know, it's an attitude of gratitude on a daily basis, starting with the first glass of water that you drink. Of course, then it could extend to the food that you consume. Every time you eat, you're eating something that comes from the earth. Usually it's a plant or an animal. And just the awareness that you can develop for everything that you consume. And the less processed it is, the more you will realize that it's a living being. An apple is a living being. It's a plant. It's alive. You know? Um, yeah, if you eat a chicken, an egg or something, you know, this this is a live being. Everything has life. It's transferring its life energy to your life energy. So when you get through with that apple, instead of just chucking it in a trash can, you know, if there's something left, go outside and put it back into the earth. You know, mm-hmm. even a piece of paper comes from a tree. You know, instead of just crumbling it up and throwing it in a waste paper basket, 
dig a little hole outside and put everything that's organic and can be decomposed, put it in a little hole and cover it up. Maybe put a little plant there. These little simple practices begin to create this awareness that has become dormant in the vast number of humans living in modern society. Yeah, when you live in a natural environment, this is so evident, it almost goes without needing to remind anyone of this fact. But when you live visiting the supermarket every day and buying things that have been canned and put in, you know, bags and it, it kind of reduces your awareness. It re actually reduces your awareness of, of what you're eating and what you're drinking, you know. Pop, pop the cap off, you drink it, you don't think twice about it, you know. So if gratitude when expressed on a consistent basis will develop the awareness that our own personal existence is dependent upon nature. And this realization will create an appreciation for nature. And then nature will, will, will come to you. Once you open yourself to nature, nature will find its way into your life. Yes. You just have to open your heart a little more. To nature. <laughs> <laughs> that might have been the few steps that I'm missing because, yeah, it's just like being outside hasn't been enough. Like I need it like all over my body. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what was I going to ask? Um, I love the way uh, in ceremonies how you make an offering of food to the to the animals and to, to nature itself, you make a plate. Um, can you talk a bit about that? You know, this uh, idea of making an offering, and sometimes we say we're asking for permission. You know this word, permission. And a lot of people have issues with this word permission you know like i tell people yeah we're going to ask for permission to to eat this or permission to drink that or permission to go swimming or permission you know they're like we don't need to ask for permission you know i go well maybe we can choose a different word okay so what what other word can you use for permission to eat you know giving thanks i don't know <laughs> Huh? Giving thanks to eat, giving thanks giving to swim. Thanks, yeah. yeah. And some people, yeah, I think, okay, so permission, thanks, you know. I think if you, if you become uh, aware that, that we are dependent on nature, then it's only right, you know, to give thanks, to make an offering. Like some people are so... I don't know what it is. Maybe they're so tight or so, I don't want to say greedy or inconsiderate <laughs> or unthoughtful, but they don't, they don't make offerings, mm. you know? They can't even scrape a little bit of food off their plate to give it to Mother Earth, you know? They just want to eat the whole thing, you know? They won't even give them a French fry. Sometimes I tell the kids, give a, put a French fry over there for, the, for Mother Earth. Why? We got to give a French fry, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, they're not taught. People are not taught to give a little bit back, you know? And what's happening is the spirit, because, and in my understanding, which I have developed this understanding, is that if the spirit isn't appeased, if, if you don't give back to the spirit in a conscious way, the spirit will take what it needs. You know, people are saying, why are there so many forest fires in California? I go, well, look at the way people in California, in California live. How many people in California go into the forest and leave an offering saying thank you for anything? 
for the wood that they built their house on, mm. or the paper that they used to, for their money that they spend. How many, how many people consciously go into the forest and say thank you? So is that sort of um, spirit can be vengeful? It can. Mm. It's not vengeful. It's balance. Okay. Yeah. This is an important word in our in, in, in our cosmic vision. It's called balance, equilibrium. Mm. Give and take. Reci- How do you say that? Reciprocal. Yeah. There's a word that sounds like reciprocity or something. I can never remember. Reci- reciprocating. Reciprocating. Yeah. Reciprocate. In other words. Don't be take, 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 mm. and then take some more, you know, <laughs> give. In a culture that honors giving, the one who gives the most is considered the richest. In a society where you accumulate and take, the person who has the most is considered the richest. It's a different way, see? In native culture, I'll speak a little bit about our native roots. Yes, please. Here here in this part of the world. We didn't have issues with attachment, as other cultures do, because we didn't have the concept of ownership. Ownership fosters attachment. Non-ownership fosters generosity. And the more generous you are, the more you receive. This is energetic understanding of life. Mm. These are laws, you could say, if you want to call them that, of existence. That the more you give, the more you will receive. And it's not to give just to receive more either. Well, it works too. If you want to receive <laughs> more, give more. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, I definitely apply that a lot in my life. Actually, yeah, it's it's. I prove it. Yeah. It's just like showing itself more and more and more. The more I'm like, I'll give you, especially when I give something that I truly love and value that is hard for me to share especially when I do that I I definitely get more back for sure absolutely and and if you don't get it back maybe you didn't need it anyway yeah yeah I usually get something different back (laughs) (laughs) yeah people are very hung up on material goods like too much way too much Mm -hmm. it's created a serious imbalance in the in the uh, the dealings that people have with other people like i trade a lot i trade feathers i trade medicines i trade you know whatever Mm -hmm. you know whenever i make a trade i always try to make sure the other person gets the better end of the deal (laughs) Yeah. And my friend who was with me, he was like, No, man, look, you're giving them, look how much you're giving them, look how much you're getting. I go, I know. He, he looked at me a little perplexed, you know, like, Why are you giving them more than what you're receiving? I tell him, This ensures that I will have more things to trade later on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you, you like, it makes you feel amazing, right? I mean, some people feel good when they get the better end of the deal. I feel better when the other person gets the better end of the deal. Yeah, yeah. When you give more, you And I try to teach my kids that. You know, I say, you have a candy bar, crack it in half. Give the big piece to your brother. (laughs) Don't give him the little piece, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And uh, how has it been, like, bringing kids into this wonderful wild world of yours? Oh, it's amazing, yeah. To see the accomplishment of of 
children associated with with the peyote culture is is just astounding because whether you're a child or an adult peyote helps you realize that in order to manifest the things you want in your life it takes a certain kind of mentality positivity mm. uh, confidence self-assuredness um, it, it makes you take into your creativity it, it helps you to to meditate and contemplate things to make right choices and if you make mistakes because most people do it teaches you to be gentle on yourself mm. as you are gentle on other people that make mistakes <laughs> <laughs> So, like kids, it, it, it makes them more, I've seen it in my own kids, you know, and um, my daughter especially, she grew up in, in, the, in the teepees. And it's funny because at school they always ask the kids, where's your favorite place to be? You know, this is like a question at some point. And she would say, the teepee. Mm-hmm. And the teacher would say, what do you mean the teepee? They didn't understand the response. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and what she meant as a child was that everything that you feel in the teepee, the love, the talk that's talked there, you know, the, the type of people that come there and all this, that's what she liked when she was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> She's lucky. She's a lucky child. She was born when when there was a huge comet in the sky. Wow. When her mom became re- pregnant, there was a, a large comet that they call it, in English they call it hail pop. It's the largest comet that humans have witnessed up to this point in history. Mm. And when, when, she, uh, when she was conceived, this huge comet appeared in the sky and was there for the period of nine months of her gestation. And when she was born, shortly after the comet took off, and and in our culture, to be born like this is, is to be lucky, mm. like like lucky stars, you know this kind of, this idea of lucky stars. And she's very lucky. There was, the, for example, when she was in high school, you know how high school kids are real cliquish. So this new girl came to school from another town. And, uh, yeah, she, you know, had a different accent, you know, looked a little different. Well, my daughter immediately, uh, with most kids that came from other high schools, she would always be friendly to them. And eventually they'd be like best friends, you know, because the new kid has, you know, there's no friends at this school. So my daughter would become her best friend. Well, one of the, one of the kids that she became friends with, was the smartest kid in class. You know, he was like the valedictorian, like Mm. straight A's. So usually when she was doing her homework projects, she had this super smart kid to do her projects with. (laughs) (laughs) That's pretty lucky. (laughs) Yeah, pretty lucky, you know. She just happened to make friends with this guy. Another, a girl that came, Nobody really knew her, but her family is one of the wealthiest families in Texas. So the next thing you know, she's like, Dad, I'm going to go in the, in my friend's private jet. We're going to go see the, the college team go play. Or we're going to go to Cabo San Lucas in Mexico for the weekend. I'm going with my friend. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty lucky. <laughs> <laughs> she's lucky. Yeah, she got the Bill Gates Millennium Foundation grant. So she's completing her four years in pre-med. She wants to be a brain surgeon. Wow. But before she does that, she got accepted to to NYU, New York University, with a $24,000 grant so that she can study on how to make medicine more accessible to people that don't have access to to medical services. Wow. This is before she goes into medical school to become a brain surgeon this is where she's thinking that's amazing 
and to have the, sure. the knowledge uh, of, and to have all of your knowledge that you're imparting on her as well as all the medical stuff that's amazing well you know i i don't want to sound too generalistic but i think children that grow up in communities that pray with peyote mm. develop good humanistic qualities i'll just say like that and and a lot of them eat peyote when when they're um, drinking breast milk wow. or when the mom's pregnant mm. and this is very beneficial for a human being to have peyote during their prenatal existence or during their after birth when they're drinking their mother's milk to have peyote in the mother's milk is a great advantage mm. for any human being yeah definitely wow and um back to the comet um how like for me personally i know that wherever the planets are it completely affects my life <laughs> And uh, can you share any knowledge that you have about the cosmos and us humans? Well, first of all, the the sun being the brightest heavenly body in our in our immediate sphere of existence was the subject of keen observation by all native people on this hemisphere, mm. and they observed the way the sun apparently moved across the horizon and this observation led them to understand the rotation of the earth and the tilting of its axis of its axis along its axis mm -hmm. and then of course the moon is the second brightest object which also became a subject of their devotion and and study and then the relationship between the sun, the earth, and the moon became of, uh, of central importance to understand our existence in the solar system, which then expanded to the planets, which it's very easy to detect the planets if you just follow the ecliptic, which is exactly the same line where the sun, the moon follow, the planets go along the same line in the heavens. Mm. So it's not hard to, to follow them. And by observing them, they were able to map out knowledge, which helped them to understand this concept of time. And they mapped it out in such a way that they could establish time, the sequence of the sun, the moon, the earth, Venus, Jupiter, Mars, all of these planets, and associate the position of these orbs, of these heavenly bodies, of these spirits, because each one has an electromagnetic energetic field the influences that it has on the humans. Now, this is commonly known as astrology, but astrology also is one of these things that it sounds like some people don't really understand it. But it's as simple as knowing where the sun's going to rise every morning. That's how basic astrology is. And to know where the moon is and what phase the moon is in. Like, if you ask somebody right now, I just ask anybody, what phase is the moon in? Like, they might know the full moon, mm. but they might know the new moon. But the common person takes no care to, to understand where the moon is and what phase. More and more awareness is being created. I shouldn't say that. Maybe maybe there are people listening and they're all answering, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I only knew because I looked up to that. <laughs> But, yeah. Oh, well, we could Google it right now. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or you could look up in the sky tonight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, everything has 
a definite influence. So people started learning, okay, if we plant certain plants on a full moon, they do better, and other plants you plant on a new moon. You know? Mm. Well, the we... effect. I was just, yeah. just going to say, well, with your daughter and the whole comet thing and, and to see how successful her life is, um, like I know there are certain planet combinations that can have an influence when someone's born to have a trajectory similar. Are there any, are there any other kind of really large phenomenons like the comet that can happen? The alignment of the planets every 52 years, as marked in the native calendars, creates a line, their, their alignment, their energetic alignment. For example, there's, there's a famous one in our culture. Every 52 years, Venus, the Earth, there are certain alignments mm. with the planet. This is the beginning of a new cycle in our calendar every 52 years there's certain calendars that are running simultaneously 260 days 13 day calendars lunar calendars venus calendar the calendar of the earth and the sun every 52 years all of these calendars they converge in English, they call this the harmonic convergence. On one of these days, there was a young child born. On the morning of this 52-year convergence, he was the first child born. So they called them Seteopilitsin, the first child born. The first child born and the sunrise of the beginning of the 52-year day cycle. Now, as this child developed, it was noted that he had an uncanny way of understanding nature. Like, he was able to communicate with nature. And this is what is looked for in individuals, their ability to communicate with nature. And as the story goes, he developed skills that allowed him to go into other dimensions. Mm. Now, the reason he was able to do this was because his spiritual existence, his energetic existence, existence and his material existence, his physical existence was in perfect harmony and balance. And when someone reaches, attains this, in some cultures they call it Christ, in some cultures they call it Buddha, in our culture we call it Quetzalcoatl. So he attained what, what we would call the Quetzalcoatl existence which means perfect harmony and balance between your energetic and your material existence. Kind of like an E equals MC squared, <laughs> you know this. Mm -hmm. You're light, we are light, mm -hmm. but yet we're physical. But most people only see the physical part. In ancient cultures, we could see the light, mm -hmm. and some people can see your light. He was able to shift between light and material. And in this realm, he was able to go into other realms. For example, he brought back corn for the native people of this continent. So he, they, they, they dubbed him, they christened him, they, they changed his name. When he was born, he wasn't called Quetzalcoatl. But they knew that he had an auspicious birth because of the alignment of the planets. Mm -hmm. So. When he became a young man, they named him Quetzalcoatl. They changed his name, or they added it to his name. He was His name was Setlauitzeopilitzin Quetzalcoatl. Now they added that. Like you add PhD to somebody's name or something like this, you know. 
<laughs> wow. And he was able to instruct the civilizations on how to construct using molecular level construction. Like how to take a stone that weighs 40 tons, shape it, and then put it next to another one that weighs 20 or 30 tons so that you can't even fit a human hair between these stones. Why? Because universal knowledge comes from the ability to transcend your own reality. And then you can acquire other information. Yeah, I've had uh, recently, actually, some kind of messages coming in because I was like, what is going on with my world and my life? And they've said to me that you're like absorbing right now all the ancient wisdom that's around you and from everyone else's ancestors that are around you. And that is very interesting, which you've just reminded me of. Have you ever heard of uh, Marie Curie? Mm, no, I don't think so. Her and her husband were using radiation. They were a French couple, or I think they were yeah, French. Anyway, the reason I mentioned her is because she was, they were, they spent their whole life looking for, for a certain formula. And she received it in a dream. Wow. And when she woke up, she tested the formula and it proved to be the correct formula. Now, some people call this subconscious. There's a lot of labels right now used for to describe the reality of humans and and a lot of them are limiting for example have you ever heard this phrase called human nature mm -hmm. okay this is a very incorrect concept okay because it it says humans are naturally aggressive humans are naturally greedy Humans are naturally selfish. Humans are naturally this and that. I tell them, I, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't use some words, but anyway, I'll, I'll slip. I was going to say, but these kind of ideas, I think, are limiting. Definitely. You know, and we don't need limits right now. We need to expand our consciousness. Well, we need limits on how much material stuff we get, but where it comes to the mind, we need to expand. Mm -hmm. We don't need things that limit. See, before they would say, look, there's heaven, there's hell, and that's all there is, okay? The world is flat, don't go to the edge, okay? You're going to fall off. <laughs> now, people, minds need to expand. You have to imagine a lot of things can be possible, especially when it comes to human existence. I won't even call it nature because it's it's like it's like incorrect these ideas they they put forth. Mm. People are taught to believe, and these plants crack that mold. Mm. They crack it wide open, and a lot of people are fearful of this because these plants the chemicals they they contain they open the mind they open the heart and even and these, even yeah. after after taking them it's like they've unlocked that part of the brain so you can go in and use it again without without having to take them yeah Mm. Exactly. You know, they connect, they, they start connecting you to other um, areas of existence that before, because you were taught not to go there. 
you simply did it. Do you read your dreams? Like I find I've I've kind of given them labels like like what you're saying about Marie. I have truth dreams which give me information about what's happening and then I have the stock standard like sorting out your week, your month. And then there's like future dreams and all, all different all different types. Do you read your dreams like that? Yeah, it, it, it's all under the I guess uh, I'm trying to use terms that people are familiar with, like mental telepathy. Yeah, okay. You know this term, mental telepathy? Yeah, where people are communicating uh, at another level besides the way we're communicating now. Mm. And this type of communication occurs when you're awake and when you're, when you're sleeping, when you're dreaming. And it sometimes is is uh, probably it can it can be very important messages that are being communicated through this um, mental telepathy and it's already been proven many times that um, there's more than one level of consciousness for example there's the mind there's the heart there's the gut mm -hmm. and each one of these is an intelligence in its own right it stores information it analyzes information and if you learn to listen just like you listen to your mind to your heart and to your gut you will you will have, you will have better instruction on how to proceed in your life Yeah. You know, and, and like I said, sometimes when you're when you're sleeping, you have relaxed the mind to the point that other messages can come through. Yeah, I look like the shower. Yeah. <laughs> you look like when you're in the shower, right? <laughs> <laughs> have all those epiphanies in there. Um, I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about um you know, masculinity and femininity and how to like embrace the two within the one human being and you know how to be a man and how to understand men and women and the role that we play with each other and the balance again <laughs> well as long as the men tell the women they're always right there'll be perfect harmony and balance oh yeah that sounds right that's about right <laughs> <laughs> like we say as long as the men have the last word everything will flow right and then what's the last word yes darling <laughs> <laughs> no it, you know it, it, there is quite a bit of um, harm that's been caused through male dominant society and most of the these male dominant societies have created such an imbalance that it, it creates an imbalance in the whole society of humanity you know most civilizations that have reached high levels of intelligence, you know, scientific, like, like take for example, the Egyptian um, statues. When I was in Egypt, the first thing I, I, I noted was that the male and the female statues were of equal stature and equal symmetry they were the same basically the male and the female and this is also common in Native American art where the symbols of male and female are equal kind of like the Sri Yantra where one triangle represents the male and the other one represents the female and they're perfect in dimension the yin and the yang these are perfectly 
balanced. Like the black is bigger than the white, or the dot in the black is bigger than the dot in the white. No, see, this is this is basically male and female. So they have to be in perfect harmony and balance. And anytime they're not in any society, it's going to create a disruptive a disruption in the flow of the society. And um, so how do you apply that within yourself, seeing as we all have masculine and feminine, how do we not allow one to take over more? Well, I mean, there's certain attributes that in human femininity and in human masculinity that are distinct. And this needs to be remarked also in other words men do not have children mm. you know? mm-hmm. and so the differences need to be honored and respected not belittled or discriminated so the the individual aspects that distinguish the male and the female need to be looked at as something magnificent and something glorious, not something to be abused or belittled. If women are more emotional and they're more attached to the moon and it affects them, this needs to be honored, not ridiculed. You know, if men are more attached to the sun and they feel like, you know, this this needs to be honored also, you know, like, so yeah, then it just, as long as there's an understanding of the differences and the equalities and everything is put into perspective, the society will, will, will form around that. For example, in our culture, there were all, all native cultures in this continent were matriarchal. And the primary creation spirit is viewed as feminine mm. not masculine because you ask the simple question where did you come from and the answer is you came from your mother so they say well where did the universe come from well from the mother of the universe mm. so this this is, you know, where did God come from? From his mother, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, with yourself, I can, I can definitely feel, you know, your feminine qualities as well as your masculine qualities. And how do you, how do you navigate the feminine within yourself? Well, it's it's the qualities of. I think I think uh, if you see a mom, you know, they're very caring. You know, mm. mothers naturally are very caring, and the mothers are on point twenty four seven. You know, they don't like if they have a child. It's not like, you know, I'm gonna put my kid outside for a couple hours and I'm gonna. So, no, they have, you know, mothers have to be on point all the time. And when I'm in a ceremony, for example, if I'm leading a ceremony, I don't take the luxury of just going into my own space. You know, like I say, okay, look, I'm, I'm leading the ceremony. I have to be here present for every, how many people are in the ceremony? 60 people? Okay, I need to, I need to be available for all 60 people for the duration of this ceremony. And I think this is a quality that, that uh, yeah, that comes from observing women and how they can be multitasking. Mm. I think women invented the term multitask. You know, mm. I don't think men had developed this quite as well as women had multitasking. You know. Well, I've seen you in action, and you you you're really quick. You're very quick. And hilarious. 
(laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, I think men tend to be a little more rigid. And I guess you could say comparing a man's light to a flashlight as like a straight line light as women are more like a light bulb. Okay. Where they can see a lot of things happening all at once. Mm. And I think it's the combination of these two. You know, I, I think it's, like I said, it's not like going overboard on one or the other. To be able to focus and yet have a wide perspective. Mm. Now, I personally you know, really... Have... Huh? Sorry, you go, you go. No, I was going to say, like, when you're in a ceremony, you know, you're looking at the whole picture, but if you see one person needs some special attention, mm. you know, there's always one kid that wants more attention than the <laughs> other person. <laughs> Could you come wave your feathers at me or something? Yeah, I think that was me my first time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I definitely, like, a peyote ceremony really makes me aware of my my masculine aspects because it feels very like yeah i'm with the boys i'm i'm sitting up straight i'm taking it i'm doing well and uh then it can also like come come from the feminine strength as well which is a whole different thing so i'm I'm, i have two two the both are very much present with each other but um i i'm definitely more masculine like because of my life situation i'm trying to trying to balance it balance it out i mean everyone everyone like i i I hear your explanation and i think everyone attributes certain characteristics to either masculine or feminine which i think at some point there's some crossover you know Mm. Like sometimes, you know, you tell the little the little boy, you know, be strong like a man. And then they say, well, why don't you tell the girl to be strong like a girl? Okay, well, be strong like a woman. Don't say girl, say woman. Okay, well, be strong like a woman. Yeah, yeah. So there's some things that I'm sure are applicable to both uh, energies, masculine and feminine. And then I say it's like, but then again, there's some that are very peculiar to either or other, you know. Mm. And I think this is where, in the analyzation of, of there has to be a balance, you know. Yeah. Um, like in our, you know, like in our culture, they say the women are closer to the earth, so they would only have the women put the seeds in the ground, for example. Mm. But then you never know if this was just a ploy by the men to say. <laughs> So that the women would be the one to plan. You know? <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> uh, um, I know that you you don't really call yourself a shaman. What what do you call yourself? Do you call yourself anything? Well, let me let me uh, say something about this word shaman. You know, because I traveled to Russia. Okay. Last year. I was invited to the festival of shamans and I received an official certification signed by the shamans of Tuva, close to Mongolia. So I am actually certified shaman. I have a certificate on my wall if you want to see it. (laughs) (laughs) So if anybody doubts that I'm a shaman, I can... I showed them my certificate. <laughs> okay. And they also gave me a, a particular medallion <laughs> that's only worn by shamans. <laughs> but um, I think that, you know, what I try to avoid, Beck, to be honest with you, is see, some people feel there needs to be a separation between the person conducting the ceremony and the participants Mm. like they want to put the person sitting you know behind that peyote button in another category like he is the medicine man or or he or she is the leader of this ritual which okay 
there's a responsibility involved, but I think in the in the long run it could be detrimental to the functioning of of these ceremonies. I think everybody needs to be looked at as their own personal shaman or medicine person. Otherwise, they create a dependency or a reliance on the actions or the words of the person leading the ceremony. And this is what I'm trying to avoid. And this is the main reason I don't like these labels. Mm -hmm. Then people come in, they eat the peyote, and they start looking, okay, so what are you going to do? How are you going to help me? You know? I'm like, look, I'm just going to sing like everybody else in here. You need to do your (laughs) own work. Yeah. So you might as well get started. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I love that. And, um... I know you have to leave soon. We need to wrap this up for you. But um, is there any anything going on that you want to let people know about? That whether it be something you're doing or something any of your friends or loved ones are doing. Well, there's so much going on. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of ceremonies happening all over the planet. You know, there's. Uh, Myself, I've, I've showed about 25 different people how to conduct ceremonies. Beautiful. And some of them are young men, young women. And I would ask the listeners to support them. I mean, it's okay to be critical, you know, I mean, in a good vein. You know, we're learning. But overall, be supportive to these individuals who have taken it taken responsibility to conduct ceremonies and help them mm. you know volunteer you know go out there and, and, and make their make their responsibilities a little lighter by assuming some of these responsibilities maybe offer to be a helper in the ceremonies you know if you already know the medicines instead of going into a ceremony where the person is new and saying, let me see how many things I can pick on this person that does he's not doing right. Maybe just go and say, hey, look, I'm familiar with these medicines. If you need some help, I'm here to help, you know. But just don't get in the way either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like this, you know, so like, and then there's a lot of new medicines. I would say always be cautious. In the same in the same sentence, I'm gonna say, be cautious if you do go to ceremonies that are being conducted by people that you don't know. Mm-hmm. Caution, caution. Don't throw caution to the wind because you might need it. Be be aware. You know, people ask me, are, what do you call yourself? A shaman, a medicine man? Basically, I say I am aware. This is my label. Yeah. I'm aware. And I'm also flexible. Because I know things are transforming constantly. Things are always changing. So even if you come to one ceremony of mine and you didn't like it, come to the next one. It might be different, you know? Mm. Yeah, I can, I can vouch for that. They were both very different. <laughs> cool. And um, I'll attach your website and how to get in contact with you and how to support you in the in the notes, quietly.com. You know, another important thing, Beck, since we're talking about peyote, and this is like the central theme, even though I know we went to very many different yeah. topics, but peyote is an endangered species. Oh, yes. That's plant. Yes. And the reason it's endangered is not because more people are eating peyote. I want to clarify this. Because the more you eat peyote, the more it reproduces. But it needs a place to grow. And its natural habitat is threatened. Just like the natural habitat of many plants and animals is being threatened. You know, plants and animals in the ocean are threatened, not because of any other reason than that the ocean itself is threatened. And the same applies to peyote. The land where it grows 
is being destroyed through mining, through uh, incorrect agricultural use. So I'm going to put a shout out there to anyone that can support efforts to create safe havens for all plants and animals that are endangered, mm. including peyote. That's that's beautiful. Yeah, that's we really needed to say that. So thank you for for doing that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I didn't hear what you said. I just said thank you for doing that. We really needed to say that. I didn't even think to mention that actually. So thank you. Yeah. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. And um, yeah, and then the other thing I would say is uh, I travel around the world a lot through this this hemisphere, and the native people of this hemisphere are are being threatened by governments. Like for example, the Brazilian president right now compared the people living in the Amazon to animals living in a zoo. This is their mentality. You know, President Trump, you know, he has no respect for the native people's rights as indigenous people. As so many presidents and governments and laws, they disrespect the, 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 the culture and the way of life of, of native people. And there are changes being made. There are some presidents, you know, Evo Morales, you know, even the Canadian president is trying to make changes. Yeah, and uh, you, can, you can see plant and medicines start, getting in yeah. there too. Like Denver, Denver just, you know, made psilocybin you know, decriminalized. So that's a win. Yeah. yeah. So this is, these are good. I, I want to I want to applaud these places. You know, San Francisco banned plastic bags and plastic bottles. Yeah. And what does this have to do with with peyote? Is that these are the kind of actions that create awareness. Mm -hmm. This is what it's all about. We need people to create more awareness of what's happening to themselves. As far as choices go, I'm, I want to leave you with this. Mm -hmm. It's easy to make proper choices. Don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt others. And don't hurt nature. You want to do something good? Do something that's going to help yourself help others and help nature hmm. thank you sir oh. all right great oh. hope to see you soon yeah thanks for listening everyone bye uh please forgive me if i missed a few things or it didn't make a great deal of sense it was 1 a.m for me and uh, I'd had a big day, but I did my best. Um, if you guys are digging what I'm doing here with the podcast, please head over to iTunes, give it a rate and review, and hit that subscribe button for me. Um, the intro music is done by Tran Exista, and I'll put a link to the Bandcamp uh, website in the show notes. And the birds were captured by Glenn from 4D Empty. And I'll pop a link to where you can get in touch with him as well. All right. Lots of love. Bye.